and welcome to Urban Green, a show that spotlights environmental efforts in the South Sound and showcases different ways to get involved in sustainable living practices. I'm Leah Michelson, and I'm pleased to introduce myself as the new host of Urban Green. Today, we are coming to you from the Prairie Line Trail in downtown Tacoma on the University of Washington Tacoma campus. This springtime edition starts with an urban learning segment that brings us to a new biogas facility at the Central Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's here we take a closer look at a project which allows the facility to produce and capture cleaner burning biogas. The city's Environmental Services Department recently completed a major upgrade to the Central Wastewater Treatment Plant, which allows the facility to produce and capture cleaner burning biogas. Biogas is a byproduct of our wastewater treatment process. We use a, a digester and much like a human stomach, it produces solids and gas. The biogas is primarily composed of methane and carbon dioxide. The number one benefit of using biogas is it replaces other gases that we might have to extract from the ground, such as oil extraction or natural gas extraction. So we're taking a waste and using it to replace a resource that we would otherwise have to extract. Renewable fuel that is naturally produced from the decomposition of organic waste can be used in a variety of ways. The city will be using biogas. We will be treating it and creating a product called renewable natural gas. That's injected into the pipeline and then it can be sold to fleets pretty much anywhere on the west coast. At this point, we are looking at using the renewable natural gas for our solid waste trucks. That's right, the organic waste that's flushed down the toilet or ground in a kitchen garbage disposal can be processed to help fuel Tacoma's solid waste collection trucks in the future. The process to get from drain to the truck is complicated. The central treatment plant collects waste from most of the city. So when people flush their toilets or wash things down their sinks, it comes to the sewer line. It's brought in at the headworks of the treatment plant. We'll remove solid material and do some treatment. Eventually it comes to the digesters to remove the organic waste part. And that also acts as a disinfectant because the anaerobic digesters they run hot, so it's hot enough to disinfect, kill any bacteria that's in the waste. That creates the solids that we use in the Tagro facility, and it also creates the biogas that we use for the renewable natural gas. The treatment plant upgrades also included other necessary energy-related improvements, such as heating and cooling upgrades and cleaner, more efficient boilers. The biogas comes from the digesters, and that gas is sort of a, a mix of a lot of compounds, carbon dioxide, methane, some sulfur compounds, and, and really quite a variety. Most everything that goes into the sewer, at least some part of that will end up in the biogas. And the purpose of the plant behind me is to remove those contaminating products so that we only have methane at the end. This fuel can also be used for heating or generating electricity. The city can also produce fuel for use by other fleets on the West Coast by establishing partnerships across the region. Renewable natural gas can be used as a fuel for vehicles. The amount we produce is over a thousand gallons per day, equivalent of diesel. The biogas project represents a significant step toward achieving the city's climate goals as outlined in the 2030 Tacoma Climate Action Plan and is an example of looking to the future towards a more climate resilient Tacoma. To learn more about how the biogas facility contributes to the 2030 Climate Action Plan, visit the city site. Up next, the urban tabletop segment will take us to Stanford's Steak. It's here we get a demonstration of a brand new item from their spring menu. Hi, I'm Scott Letourneau, corporate chef for Stanford Steak. Today I'm going to walk you through one of our signature items, which will be our lobster tail and grilled filet. We're going to start out by taking this all the way from its whole state uh, tenderloin, and we're going to cut that down into six ounce filets. This is our 1855 filet mignon, which is an upper two thirds of choice. So what that means is, that upper two thirds is choice is a very broad uh, grade 
Uh, that upper two thirds gets you as close to you can as prime without kind of getting all of those prime prices uh, that you have to incur. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna trim off this chain. I'm gonna take off some of the excess fat and I'm gonna trim off this silver skin that you see on top, uh, which is not very palatable. I'm gonna go ahead and set this to the side. I can trim up that. There's some good meat on there that can be put into other dishes. I'm gonna remove this silver skin off the top. I'm gonna slide that knife as tight to the silver skin as possible without removing any meat all the way down the line. You want to really minimize as much meat as you take off here. You're just trying to take off that, just that top portion. Once you get that trimmed all the way down, we're going to get ourselves a nice couple of 1855 fillets. I'm going to trim off just the end of this so we get a nice center cut piece that shows up really well on the plate. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Once we're here, I'm gonna look at my back chain and I'm gonna remove just a little bit of this excess fat. Filets are really, really lean, cut of meat, very soft in texture. So we're gonna remove some of this rib fat that's off the back. From here, I'm gonna get a nice cut on a six ounce filet, very nice. Nice marbling on the inside. I'm gonna trim that down. This is certainly an opportunity. I know when I'm at home, this is 1855 premium, but you know, when I go out and I buy meat at the store, a lot of times I will get a a whole filet like this and trim it down. And all this stuff in here you can use for stews uh, or you can saute up in a different dish. But here we've got our nice six ounce filets all ready to go for the grill. All right, our next step will be with our lobster tail. What you wanna do when you're cutting through this shell, pretty easy. You could just use household scissors to cut through. You're gonna start right underneath the shell and you're gonna slide that blade as close to the top of the shell as you can, putting pressure at the top. So you just cut through the top of the shell. You wanna cut through that last little segment that's right there in the back. You're gonna flip the lobster over and you'll see that the lobster's got little ribs that run down the back of it. All you need to do is just take your scissors Get the, one of those ribs and just twist and break that rib. Just like that. That's gonna allow it to do is separate out and let you remove the meat really easily. I'm gonna get two fingers underneath the meat, pull that meat all the way to the top of the shell, and just lay that right on top of it. What I'll do is I'll cook down on the shell. We want to make sure it's cleaned out and there's no waste in there. But that looks fantastic, ready to go for the pan. All right, one final step before we get this into the oven. I'm gonna place a little bit of chicken sauce stock in the bottom of this pan. What this is gonna do, it's gonna allow that pan to have a little bit of moisture so it doesn't dry the lobster out. And also, I'm gonna baste the top of that with a little bit of clarified butter. Once that's finished, I'll spread out the tail just a little bit so when it's finished cooking, it'll have a great presentation straight into the oven. All right, it's time to start grilling. We have our six ounce filet that we have cleaned up and ready to go. I'm gonna use our house-made seasoning, steak seasoning. You can use whatever seasoning that you really like. Uh, here we have thyme, kosher salt, chili flakes, granulated garlic, granulated onion. I'm liberally seasoning all sides of the steak, top and bottom. 
and I'm going to place that right on the grill at a nice hot spot so I can get some good marks on it. At home, so you can get surround heat, it's great to have a dome. What that does is it gives you nice all around heat and allows that filet to really sear off and give it nice color. We're going to let that sit on the grill for about two and a half minutes per turn. Uh, the filet at medium rare should take you all of about 12 minutes. And don't forget that you want to rest your steak after you're done for at least five minutes uh, to allow all that juice to reabsorb into the steak. Now that our steak is rested for five minutes, we're ready to plate. We have our nice six ounce filet that's been resting. So that juice is all reabsorbed into that meat. We have a wonderful looking lobster's tail. As you can see, it's not over curled, uh, not overcooked. Our tail is fanned out nicely. We're gonna plate that pointing in the opposite direction. Now with this, you can serve it with your favorite veg or your starch. With the Surf and Turf at uh, Stanford Steaks, we serve ours with our lime basmati rice. So I have house-made lime basmati rice, which we're gonna pile up. And I'm keeping everything inside the rim nice and clean. And then I've chosen to do uh, some nice grilled asparagus. I just took these on the grill, brushed them with a little bit of oil your favorite seasoning. So you get a little bit of char marks on there. And we're gonna finish off our plate with a little bit of drawn butter or clarified butter. You're just gonna melt down your butter. It's gonna separate a little bit and you wanna just remove that butter from the top that's clear. Therefore, you're getting the best sauce that's not gonna interfere with your lobster in any way. I've roasted off a little uh, garlic clove here and just put a little rosemary sprig in the middle of it just to kind of get fancy and then I have a blistered lemon. What I've done is I've just taken that lemon, I put it on the grill just to create a little bit of char. It's gonna caramelize off some of the sugars in the lemon. Goes wonderfully on top of the lobster. Little angle on top of your rice. We have our surf and turf. Clean up our rim a little bit. And we're ready to go. To find out more about Stanford's Steak, where the focus is on traditional ingredients with complex flavors, visit their website. After the break, we'll learn more about Litter Free 253. But first, the Urban Quick Tip will demonstrate how to make a natural microwave cleaner.
Welcome back. Now we're taking a look at Litter Free 253. This is a group of volunteers who promote the idea that residents can help to keep Tacoma clean. Litter Free 253 is a volunteer group with a goal for our community to live in a healthy, sustainable environment. They use consultation, education, and encourage residents to participate in litter cleanup events throughout Tacoma. They also connect individuals to city programs that will best suit their litter needs. Litter Free 253 is also the idea though that every day we can have a clean, healthy, safe community. Everyone can come out and just make their little section of uh, Tacoma beautiful, um, spending three to five minutes a day. So Litter Free 253 really is just that idea of sustaining our community and keeping it clean. This idea was born about five years ago when the West End Neighborhood Council was doing their own cleanup events. Five or six years ago when I moved to Tacoma, I met with somebody out of Neighborhood and Community Services Department and I said, I want to do something with litter pickup. I said, it's so littered in Tacoma. And it's something that really stuck out at me was how littered it was. And so I met other people interested in keeping their neighborhoods clean. And we planted the seed and got support from Mayor Woodard for the first citywide cleanup. Now, three years later, this group holds an annual citywide litter event in celebration of Earth Month. They also work to support a number of other cleanup events throughout the year. Litter Free 253 consults with many different groups around the city that pick up litter regularly. Many people have adopted spots. We work with groups in safe streets and participating in litter cleanups. We also recently have started uh, something called a pop-up cleanup which all of the neighborhood councils are involved with. We have regular cleanups in Blueberry Park, Larchmont neighborhoods, all across the city. There are also tips for community members interested in doing an independent cleanup in their neighborhood. Picking up litter is kind of like housework. It's never done. So I think the first thing everyone can do is keep the, their curb in front of their home clean, as well as their sidewalk. If you take a walk with your dog or take a walk with a friend, Take along a little bag and a, and a glove or a litter grabber and pick up litter along your route. And if you visit one of our beautiful metro parks, help pick up the litter. The staff cannot by themselves keep our parks as clean as we would like them to be. Getting involved with Litter Free 253 is as easy as reaching out for more information. Well, the first step would be is to reach out and contact us either through the Litter Free 253 Facebook page or you can email us at litterfree253 at gmail.com. We'll be happy to answer your questions. Maybe you have a team ready to go and you just need supplies. We can connect you to the appropriate city services to get your supplies or Metro Parks for their chip-in program. So just shoot us an email. We're happy to help. This group is proud to promote the idea that everyone is needed to help keep Tacoma clean. There's a million and one ways to keep our city clean, and all it takes is the residents and their elbow grease. To get involved with Litter Free 253 and find out more about the events and support they offer year round, visit the group's Facebook page. Up next is the Urban How To. This segment offers a do it yourself guide to composting. Hi, I'm John with the Enviro Challenger program and we're here at the Enviro House today to save this compost bin and talk a little bit about how composting works. This bin has been ignored and left alone and things have gone a little crazy and they're out of balance. And that's one of the things about a compost bin that's important is balance. You can see in this bin there's not a lot of green material. It's actually gone to a lot of what they refer to as brown material. And so this is a good example of an almost finished compost right now. On the other side, we've got a little bit of green material that we're gonna have to start to incorporate into this pile so that we can keep it going and bring back some things. So one of the balances is the balance between the brown materials and the green materials. You do wanna make sure that we have a little bit more brown than green. Some people like ratios, so here's one, two to one. If you were to put too many greens in, say, two greens to one brown, you would start to notice that it might smell. 
And that's one of the things we can look at to tell if we're out of balance again, is things like smells. So another part that we want to make sure that we're balancing is the water level or the moisture content. As you can see in this pile here, if I put my hands in it, it's not very wet or moist at the top here. It's actually very dry. And a lot of people might think this is perfect, but it actually doesn't have the moisture in it that the plants are gonna want or need. So this really is something that is very dry now and it's not got a lot to offer any of the microbes or the organisms that might wanna come up into the soil and eat anything. So as you can see, this pile here needs to either be cleaned out and used or added more water added to it. On our pile over here, we're gonna to wanna to add some water to this and make sure that we bring back some moisture content because there's bugs and microbes and insects down in here that actually need that water to do their job and to help the material that's in here break down and stay available for those critters to eat. If we just let it sit here, nature will take its course, but the stuff on the top will always look like the stuff on the top. If we turn it, and make sure that we incorporate the stuff on the top to the bottom a little bit, we're actually gonna present that material to those organisms that are living in this pile. And we're gonna bring the food to them and we're gonna actually start to break that material down. So if we were starting brand new and we were gonna build our own compost pile at home, it's very easy to do. This is probably one of the better systems to contain it all. And this is a tube in system. The idea is, is that we're going to build a layer cake, again, with that balance of browns and greens. For every green we add, we want to add two browns. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping that in cover. When we start, we're going to actually build like we build a layer cake. As you look here at our bin, you can tell that this is approximately about three feet by three feet by three feet. And that's about the size you want to kind of start at. You can start a little bit smaller, but at this size, we have actually kind of an optimum size in order to get the breakdown and this, the materials that we need for all the heat to create that we're kind of going to want to have. Once we have our layer cake built up, one of the cool things about the tube bin system is that I can slide over here if it's empty and I can start building this pile right here because you're not going to stop eating. You're not going to stop working on the yard. You're going to continue to have green materials and brown materials that you want to break down we can actually start the pile here. And while I'm building this pile, I can come back to this pile, get my trusty pitchfork out, and go ahead and lift and turn. Lift and turn. But the idea is, is that every couple of days, if you can, at least once a week, every couple of days if you can, you wanna turn this pile. And again, as we're turning the pile, it's kinda like mixing all the ingredients. At first, you want to see that cool layer cake, but then eventually, you just want it to be all mixed ingredients, and you want to keep turning it. And then while you're turning it, you want to give it a little sprinkle of water. You don't want it to be sopping wet. You don't want it to be bone dry. You want it to be about the, si the, the wetness of the towel after you got out of the shower and dried off. Just damp, not wringing wet. If your pile gets too wet, it will slow down all the heat and all the processes that are helping to break everything down. If it's gonna rain or something like that for days, we might wanna cover our new pile. But in the middle of the summer, you're probably gonna to have to add water to it. So, how do we know when we're ready to use the compost that we've been working so hard at creating and we wanna give this out to our plants and help them out? Because that's the idea with the compost is we're gonna provide this stuff that's gonna give nutrients and help water our plants, help them retain that water. So. One of the things is when we start looking at our pile, if we're actually getting to a temperature, which is something we haven't talked about yet, if you want a hot pile, you're gonna to wanna to turn it a lot and you might get up to temperatures of 150 degrees or so. And you're gonna actually kill off a lot of weeds and germs and pathogens that might be on your, some of your plants. If you don't wanna get up to those temperatures or you're not gonna turn the pile so much, you might be able to get up to temperatures of about 110 degrees, which will do a great job of breaking things down, but it won't kill any of the weeds or any of the bad stuff that might be on the plant. So you're gonna to wanna to avoid putting those things in the pile. When we're looking at our pile and we look down and everything in here kinda of doesn't look like it started, if we can go from looking like this to looking like this, we're ready to go. These how-tos were created in partnership with the EnviroHouse Free Workshop Series, 
designed to support healthy, sustainable homes and gardens. For a full listing of online workshops, visit the city's site. Thank you for joining me for my first edition as host of Urban Green. I'm Leah Michelson, leaving you with more ways to engage in sustainable living practices that are right for your lifestyle.